welcome to HealthCast. I'm your host, Adam Patterson. Today we're joined by Dr. Sofia Califano, Deputy Chief Consultant for Preventative Medicine at the Veterans Affairs National Center for Health Promotion. Dr. Califano has combined an extensive background in healthcare and the study of infectious disease in service of VA's COVID-19 vaccination efforts, a process that has required rapid mobilization and broad reorganization of the agency's public health apparatus. Dr. Califano has overseen some of the VA's most demanding public health work during the COVID-19 pandemic and has helped lead efforts to bring the pandemic to a close and provide wholesale inoculation to all of America's veterans. Dr. Califano, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on. So as a starter, can you tell us a bit about your background as a physician and your work with VA prior to the pandemic? Sure. Um, So I am a preventive medicine and infectious diseases physician. A lot of my um, training took place in VA. I started out uh, practicing primary care full-time at Durham VA in North Carolina after my um, ID preventive medicine public health training at University of North Carolina. And then in 2019, I took a position as deputy chief consultant for preventive medicine for VA's National Center for Health Promotion Disease Prevention. And that was doing general health promotion and preventive services guidances. And then less than a year later, uh, COVID-19 was just making its way to the United States. And many of us volunteered to help with the national COVID-19 response. So I've been helping with that since then, along with a really great team. And then in August, our team started to get together to plan for COVID-19 vaccine in VA, which was a pretty optimistic turning point. I could only imagine, and I could only imagine how much uh, the COVID-19 pandemic really refined your mission. And for our audience's understanding, what is the National uh, Center for Prevention's mission and general priorities, and how have these been uh, refined by the COVID-19 pandemic? So our, our mission is promotion of wellness and general health, and also ensuring that all veterans have great access to clinical preventive services, including screening, vaccination, and the COVID-19 pandemic, it's really been all hands on deck for all of VA. We are all doing as much as we can to make sure veterans are protected, they're getting the care that they need, that our our teams and our hospitals are, are well supported. We've had to think really creatively about how to keep up preventive services and healthcare with the changes of the year. So you know, some of the things that we work on normally, obesity, weight management, and increasing activity, those are problems that have not gone away with the pandemic. So we still need to be working on those. But we also need to think about how we can do those services virtually, and then how we can respond to each new change that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought. So a lot of folks in our office are just like all offices in VA, really, and sites in the field are people are helping each other. They're filling multiple roles. Everyone is just doing everything we can to get through this together and make sure our veterans and staff come through this as well. Yeah, I can imagine it really required a very serious reshuffling of priorities and of resources and of of skills and talent and human capital that seems that both the NCP and the VHA more broadly have really, really succeeded at. Which brings me a bit to my next question about the management of vaccine distribution and prioritization, which is how has the VHA prioritized vaccine distribution in terms of age groups and demographics so far? So we are following guidance that was developed by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. That's the independent advisory committee that works with CDC. And that's the guidance on allocation of vaccine when, when the supply is highly limited. We know um, that COVID affects all of us, affects all of our families, but not equally. So the first vaccinations were highly focused, especially when the supply was very constrained on the people that were at highest risk. So COVID-19, as you know, in particular, has really devastated people that are in nursing homes. The oldest people among us has also been worse uh, for people that have high risk medical conditions. And then in addition to that, it's also affected our infrastructure, our economy, it's amplified inequities. So the initial phases of vaccination have all focused, in addition to those at highest risk, also focused on on healthcare infrastructure, the economy, essential workers in in specific frontline industries. The vaccines that, um, that we started with 
had really stringent handling and storage and, and transportation requirements. And, and what that meant for us is that there's always been some flexibility around how we approach the CDC and ACIP guidance so that we make sure that we're following this, we're protecting those at highest risk, but we're also rolling out vaccination in, in a way that's feasible and efficient. And we're starting now to see supply increase. With that, we should see vaccine available to a lot more people. The other thing that I should mention that we're seeing that wasn't a big factor when we started planning and when we were thinking through risk of individuals, we're now seeing the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 variants. And with those variant viruses that are more infectious or, or spread better from person to person, and with more really encouraging, I should say, information about how um, the vaccines that we have can prevent asymptomatic infection and spread of virus. That tips our balance a little bit. We still want to make sure we're protecting those at highest risk and making sure they have great access to vaccine. But the speed of vaccination, just maximizing the number of people vaccinated in the United States is also a top priority. It's not just an individual only protection anymore. We know that vaccine protects the person being vaccinated and then it also protects those around them. And so as, as variants spread, we're thinking also about community immunity and large scale participation in vaccination in addition to focusing on our highest risk groups. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And it sounds like it also requires a considerable attention to uh, procurement and supply chains, which brings me to my next question, which is, what logistical steps have been necessary for VHA to take to ensure that nationwide uh, vaccine access is open? That's a great question. So there has been so much planning that has gone into making sure that we can maximize access, maximize the distribution and the spread of vaccines across VA, across the nation in a way that's equitable. And We've done that as, as much as possible within the constraints of the first two vaccines that were authorized. So the first two vaccines, the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna, had so many constraints to work around. So again, the specific transport, the ultra-cold storage, and then a lot of specific timing between like thawing and diluting and using within six hours. Our pharmacy team has worked very hard on getting the orders organized centrally. Our logistics team had to work really hard on planning to make sure that we had the right freezers, storage capacity. We learned more about freezers than I thought we'd ever need to know. Purchase freezers to be able to store the ultra-cold vaccine products. And then worked a lot with VA leadership across the country just to make sure that we were sending the same number of freezers and had the same amount of vaccine approximately being sent to each area of the country. Some other constraints to work around, the first vaccine, that Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, had a really large minimum order size, so it was about 1,000 doses, plus the ultra-cold freezer. So that was limited generally to the larger centers that had enough staff and patients so that we could use that vaccine quickly. Again, we don't want vaccines sitting on the shelf or sitting in the freezer. We want it protecting staff and veterans. And then that second vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, also had strict requirements, also had limited options on redistributing it, but a smaller minimum order size. So that meant we could send it to more places, smaller places, places with fewer staff and veterans. And we worked really hard from there to find ways to transport vaccine to more rural areas, smaller clinics a lot of creative um, work on the ground to make that happen. In Montana, they did some work with fixed wing planes to get to some rural sites. In New Mexico, they were doing things primarily via ground transportation and mobile unit, a mobile team to vaccinate there. And then what's exciting more recently is the Janssen vaccine or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that was just authorized. And that one can be stored at refrigerator temperatures, can travel more easily. It's a single dose vaccine. And that's opened up a lot of possibilities on where we can send vaccine. And then the, the other thing in terms of ensuring access to vaccine and ensuring that we're sending enough vaccine, the other piece to that is, is quantity of vaccine. So the folks in the field across VA have stepped up and have been able to deliver some really um, 
impressive high volume vaccination clinics, after hours, weekend clinics, mobile clinics, drive-through clinics. But in the United States, there still is not enough vaccine supply to support vaccinations for everyone who wants it. And, and that is the ultimate goal to be able to offer vaccine to all staff and all veterans who want to be vaccinated. And we should be there soon and we're hoping to be. Absolutely. And that sounds like an impressive level of thoroughness, especially in addressing the challenges of rural care, because, you know, from my, again, novice understanding, there was a lot of challenges initially with the vaccines that had to be stored in especially cold temperatures. But it sounds like with, as you mentioned, the advent of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that has become less of a uh, exacting kind of challenge. As kind of a concluding question on that topic, uh, we're recording this episode in late March of 2021. About how many, uh, if you were able to give an estimate, of veterans within the VHA care system have received at least the first dose vaccine at this point? So at this time, we have on March 23rd, we have 1,197,424 veterans who are fully vaccinated. That's either a dose of the Janssen vaccine or two doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech or Moderna vaccine. In terms of overall individuals who have received at least one dose of vaccine, it's about 2,136,000 individuals who have received at least one dose of the Pfizer or Moderna, that's the two-dose series, and another 41,000 who have received the Janssen vaccine. So we're now working with a mix of two-dose series, single-dose series, and again, things the complexity increases and, and will probably increase a bit further going forward. But what's exciting is that means more people being vaccinated and protected from COVID-19. Absolutely. And that, that's really heartening to hear. That's an impressive rate of vaccination, even at this small of a time frame. Which brings me to my concluding question, especially in light of all the clear work VHA has done to adapt around the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, refine its supply chain and really work on broad distribution, which is how have the demands of the pandemic helped refine the VHA's approach to vaccination and public health as a whole going forward? Well, that's a great question. I think when we think about public health as a whole, there have been a lot of challenges and losses this year and overall major changes in the way we deliver care. And some of them have been really positive. So we've learned to handle a lot of things virtually. We've gotten great at that this year. And we've also learned to hone in on, on which of the needs require an in-person visit. And, and that is critical, obviously, for infection prevention right now. But it also, you know, going forward will benefit people who live at a long distance from medical centers, people who have trouble getting off work, trouble coming in, people who maybe just don't want to come into the medical center. So if we can use the strengths of this year going forward as sort of a hybrid of virtual and in-person care, I think that's exciting for a lot, especially of our health promotion activities and public health activities. It's truly patient-centered. We can meet patients where they are. We can work around their lives and their needs. We've been able to see veterans in their home, meet their pets and their families. So I think that virtual care hybrid with in-person care is really exciting. For vaccination specifically, obviously that still needs to be in-person. We have learned to deliver this year at a really high volume and a fast pace. And a lot of sites have now mastered the art of the drive through vaccination clinic. We were doing that before COVID, but not to this level. And that will likely continue. We should see some changes in informatics, the way we track vaccination status. That could be very positive as well. Overall, I'm, I am really hopeful, though, that this is not how we'll be doing things in a few years. So the hope is that we will be back to slower vaccinations during primary care or other visits having time ahead, advance notice of how much supply of vaccine we'll have, the optimism and excitement of the COVID-19 vaccination clinics is, is wonderful, but the goal is to, to stop the pandemic. So we may still need yearly vaccine boosters. We may still have outbreaks in the future, but the hope is that we will never have to hurry and move mountains quite like we have this year and that we can take the positives and the lessons that we've learned and, and be more patient-centered. But move back to a, a slower pace and a more, again, patient-centered and relaxed care provision environment, hopefully for the coming years. Absolutely. It all, it all sounds very promising, even amidst all these challenges that there have been, you know, uh, learnings taken away and that the uh, pandemic is being wrapped up with this level of thoroughness and, and logistical care. 
Well, I just want to say this was incredibly informative and thank you so much for coming on the program, Dr. Califano. Thanks so much for having me on. Take care. HealthCast is a production of Government CIO Media and Research. For more podcasts, head to governmentciomedia.com slash podcasts. If you liked what you heard, let us know by leaving a review in iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. HealthCast is produced by Amy Kluber, hosted by Melissa Harris and Adam Patterson. If you're interested in sponsoring a podcast, contact us at sponsor at governmentcio.com.